Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Lee. And we are blessed to have Pastor Kevin Lee speak with us one more time. He is the senior pastor at Port Orchard, uh, at Calvary Church at Port Orchard in Washington State. So, uh, and he also taught engineers, so he's very sharp. But what I am, I, I like the most is he's been married for 47 years. Those are the heroes of our culture, I believe. And he's got great grandkids. So I'll just uh, turn it over to you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. And, and um, you know, it was nuclear engineering uh, degree people coming in, you know, a different degree people at the nuclear shipyard because I was a nuclear Navy, plus took um, college course level engineering physics. And and uh, so I, I'm not a degree person, but I love to research things and look at things out of the box, which is what hydroplate theory is. And so we're going to talk earthquakes based on that. And um, so let's see, why is it? Okay. Uh, many believe that the global flood is a myth. Earthquakes are a result of processes that have been at work for billions of years. Um, this presentation goal is that to present scientific evidence that earthquakes are a consequence of the flood of Noah, which occurred about 5,000 years ago, and explain how earthquakes cause plate movements rather than plate movements causing earthquakes. And, and that's that's key. I mean, basically, hey, these plates are moving and they cause earthquakes. No, the earthquakes create magma and magma movement creates earthquakes. And so earthquakes and volcanoes are really related. And I had a seismologist tell me once when I was telling him to, you guys should be looking at that volcano erupting off the coast of Washington and Oregon. And he says, well, that's for volcanologists. And from a hydroplate theory perspective, volcanologists and seismologists should be in the same room together. And we'll explain why that's the case as we go through here. And, discuss, and, and we're going to conclude with unusual earthquake phenomena that cannot be explained by plate tectonics or catastrophic plate tectonics, but, is perfect, but perfectly fits with Dr. Brown's hydroplate theory. And I'm going to posit the consequences of the global flood 5,000 years ago are still at work preparing the world for a judgment by fire in the last days, including a global runaway earthquake that the Bible talks about. Uh, well, also, I'm going to demonstrate something I haven't ever done before, how to help you to use the USGS earthquake map to do your own research on past earthquakes. And this has been a very helpful tool to me uh, to just get facts straight and you can research any earthquake in the past, how many earthquakes in the last year, the last 10 years, and all, you can do all kinds of things that I'll show um, the audience how to do. So earthquakes. Um, what we find out every time there's an earthquake is there's news articles like this, violence of tremors stuns experts. Um, they didn't expect at Christ Church an earthquake that caused massive ground acceleration far greater than what they expected for a five to six uh, quake. And you'll see things like the size of Japan's quake surprises seismologist. Um, it was one of the top 10, those, the what I call the Fukushima earthquake in 2011, 8.9 magnitude, top 10 ever, occurred on an irregular fault line where a smaller trembler would be expected by catastrophic plate or plate tectonic people. They go, how could this little irregular fault area create such a massive quake? And in Italy, um, the people had an experience an earthquake and the seismologist said, oh, well, you know, everything's good now. The stress was relieved. And so go back and do your business. And then another quake came and killed a bunch of people. And so they were going to try. They did try seismologists for manslaughter for bad advice because their advice was based on their premise of uh, plate tectonic mindset uh, frame of reference. So uh, there is no one that disputes that continental and ocean plates are moving, but this presentation will dispute the standard explanation for this movement. And no one disputes that continental and, oh, wait, I it. And current seismology is wrong. And the following explanation is gonna be presented. 
So I did a, in 2012, I did an earthquake presentation at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa that has other information. I'm skipping on this presentation and you can get this. You can go to online and say, Pastor Kevin, Earthquakes 2012 update Google search, and it'll go to our YouTube channel where you'll be able to go to this and watch it for free. Uh, or you can get a DVD for it by contacting us. And But this is the based on the ninth edition of Dr. Brown's book. This is the cover of what will soon be published in hardbound book uh, soon. And it's titled the it's titled the origin of ocean trenches, earthquakes, and the ring of fire, based on the hydroplate theory. And so, literal view of Genesis account that the flood of Noah was a global cataclysmic event, and fountains of the great deep, as it says in Genesis seven eleven. And one day, the fountains of the great deep burst up. Not mad, as I mentioned in the comment, not magma, but water fountains. Uh, you know, implies water that uh, then created 40 uh, days of global rainfall. And, and the windows of heaven were open. I forgot to mention this in the comment presentation, but it, you know, for years, the windows of heaven you know, was the support for the canopy theory of the windows opened and let the water come down, uh, the canopy that was above. But from a hydroplate theory perspective, God opened the windows to, to allow water to go up into space, water and debris to go up into space, and some of it to come back down. So he opened the windows and it's a two-way exchange is what was meant by the Genesis account in 7-Eleven. And then this is an animation that was done by a guy who was, um, he, he did this as a college project actually. And we've seen this in other presentations, but for those that are just joining us now, there was a rupture. Uh, the crack got wide enough for the mantle to pop up into the crack and cause, oops, I went, I, I gotta go back up. Um, to uh, the mantle pops up into the differential pressure area left by the eroded crust and, and the plate starts to skid along. And then it, uh, and it's on water. It's on very slick water of supercritical. And then that is indicative that rising there for the purposes of this discussion would be symbolic of the Pacific Ridge that was rising after the Atlantic Ridge started the movement. So the movement started by the continental, the, the broken continent, moving away from the Atlantic Ridge towards the West for America. And then it runs over. Many people believe we're sitting here on the West Coast on top of what was the rising ridge where the crack was in the Pacific area. And you'll also notice that then it settles down and it even shows in this animation water under the uh, under the what became mountains and the ridge area there. And when you have certain volcanic eruptions, you have pyroplastic flow. I mean, where supercritical water is getting up to the surface and pyroplastically explodes the top of the mountain off, just like Mount St. Helens here on the West Coast. And so and there has been continuity. Uh, studies done near the plateaus and mountain ranges and what they have determined scientifically is there's trapped underneath mountain ranges brackish aqueous solution so there's trapped water still you know not all the water escaped during the compression event which is the continents moving not all of the water uh was uh, moved away so then the ocean basins opened up and the water went away. So uh, Dr. Walt Brown theory postulates that the 46,000 mile ridge, which are in red there, formed as a result of Noah's flood. We spent a lot of time talking about this previous discussions. And so the Atlantic Ridge rose first, causing the North America, what has now become the North American plate after the entire plate of the whole earth was broken up by the ridge and it moves to the West and Africa and Europe move to the East. And that's shown by this slide as well. And you can notice that this is exactly what would happen if the mantle bowed up into this area because it lost all the weight of the crust that you would see these axial Risk because it's bowed up. So it's going to crack in tension axially. 
And then because it's it's starting from one place and then ripping up, going like north and south here on the Atlantic Ridge, you would also have these uh, rifts that are going to be perpendicular to the axis. And that's exactly what we see. It, we see something that is, from an engineering standpoint, is perfectly explainable by the Boeing up ridge rather than seafloor spreading that the CPT people want to advocate. Um, so it's all moving towards the Pacific, the continents moved and crashed towards the Pacific where 90% of the earthquakes are located. And the hydroplate theory uh, posits that, that there was also crust, the Pacific plate is not visible. So we still have the North American plate, the South American plate that broke off from what was a solid plate all around the world. The European, the Asian and African plates, but, we also say that the Pacific plate collapsed as a result of the rising Atlantic plate. We'll talk about that. And there were, so there was a plate here off of South America, we believe. There was a part of the Pacific plate was here and here. Uh, the andesite line that's about here in the Pacific shows that volcanoes to the left side have andesite, which is, gives it a different kind of con, uh, of magma is created by melted granite. So even though they haven't found the, like they did in Zealandia, we covered this earlier in previous conversations too, 2017 scientists claim and discovered that there is, there is this Zealandia crust that's just submerged. Uh, Walt Brown predicted that that would be there. And he also predicted that it's going to be up here and someday they're going to discover that too. And the andesite line pretty much proves that it was there because the magma has a constituency of having been formed with granite in it as well. So, um, but what forces were at work to cause the Pacific crustal plates to subside, the crustal plate to subside? And we have to understand what happened when the Atlantic Ridge rose. And when that ridge is going up, it doesn't allow for, a, you can't create a void underneath the ridge. So something has to fill in as it's rising up. And so then here's a animation that and Mike Snavely uh, did in 2012 when I was in Costa Mesa that he did for my buddy, Mike Snavely. <laughs> Since he brought this training aid, I never thought of making this one. So this is his idea when he communicates this. In, in a sense, if I want to, this is the Atlantic, and I want it to bow out and to, you know, leave its spherically round pre-flood earth shape. And because the crust is moving off of the Atlantic Ridge, we'll call this the Atlantic Ridge, the black spot there, because the crust is moving off this way and this way, the mantle wants to pull up. But as the mantle pulls up, it has to pull everything on the inside of the earth towards it. And so that's this coat hanger is hooked on to this side. And so if I'm going to pull the mantle on this side, I'm going to create a suction on the other side. Everybody see that? I pull it more and more. Hopefully I won't break his training aid. I'll have to buy him a new one. And, and this is actually uh, what the Pacific looks like along the trenches. See that, that cusp shape? If you look carefully at the trenches in the Pacific side of the ocean, a picture of them, you can't go look at them, uh, but they're all in this cusp shape and because the Pacific got sucked down. It didn't subduct, it sucked down. As the ridge rose. So, um, so hope that training aid helps and we've already been pointing out, several have pointed out the cusp shape is totally consistent with the hydroplane theory premise that the Pacific was was pulled by the rising Atlantic and completely inconsistent with plate Excuse me, Pastor Lee, the your sound is a little bit soft right now after the after the video. Is there anything that yeah. you might have is done? Is it better now? Is it better now? It's better now, yes. Okay. I forgot to move my microphone away from my speaker. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So um so then here's a, another, uh, you know, this is looking at uh, what's happening here. So now we're looking from the South Pole at the Earth with the, the 
you know, we've got the brown crust here. We've got the water, the subterranean water, and we've got the pre-flood earth. Somebody was mentioning in a previous that maybe there was a core to the earth, a solid core, but there wasn't a, we, we really speculate and posit that there was no liquid um, outer core. But here's here's the American plate, then the African plate. And so American plate, African, actually African and Asian plate, and then the Pacific plate, which is in red at the bottom, and mostly underwater now, not completely underwater now, but mostly underwater. And then we, uh, just a second here. And we're going to show an animation from looking at the South Pole of what's going on. And so what's happening is the crack is widening. It, this is for, you know showing three different areas of the 47,000 mile uh, mid-oceanic ridge area where it is today, but where the rupture occurred at the time. And then it's continuing to grow until... The Atlantic now is unbalanced enough where the mid-oceanic ridge in the Atlantic, called the Atlantic mid-oceanic ridge, it starts to rise. And as soon as it's lifting up, just like that coat hanger with the basketball, it has to pull material up with it. And, and by the laws of physics, on a spherical change, the, all those tension lines would have been created throughout the Earth. And any movement in the Earth, which goes to hundreds of thousands of pounds per square inch, any movement is going to cause melting of all the faulting that is occurring as a result of this inner earth moving. And so then it's rising up and it's melting the inner earth. And now the liquid is starting to, uh, liquid outer core is starting to form. Uh, in this animation that was done by Brian Nichol, it, out of this melted inner uh, earth material, some of the some of the higher temperature melting point stuff will fall into the center and become the solid core. Uh, so I'm going to stick with what Brian and others have animated here, that out of this melt came uh, high melting temperature materials that fell into the center of the earth and became the solid core surrounded by the liquid core. And I want to point out right here, as Brian is showing, that... Um, Oops, I want to point out right here. Oh, I can't do it. Um, it. The animation won't let me point out that, see the Benoff zones and the bottom in the Pacific. As that plate comes down, you have this red line to the right at the bottom. And those are Benoff zones where you're going to have faulting through the mantle all the way to the liquid outer core. And you're going to have all this faulting along the bottom, all this faulting in here, creating all these faults all the way to the liquid core and this bent off zone right here as the earth is shrinking. So this, this uh, dotted line here is the original radius of the earth or original circumference of the earth. And this is demonstrating the 180 miles, that little gap there is 180 miles of shrunken earth. And so the mantle is shrinking on itself as the inner earth is melting and contracting. And that gives the appearance of subduction, but it is not subduction. It is the pull down of the melting of the inner earth that's collapsing uh, the mantle and, and crustal pieces in the Pacific that were above it. So hopefully that made sense. And this is a engineer's um, diagram of what would happen if you lived on the Atlantic side. You're going to cone. You're going to cone down to the center, and you're going to cone out to the other side uh, from an engineering standpoint. And so, viewed from the North Pole, you're going to see that Dr. Brown has calculated that the shrinking of the inner Earth after less than one percent of the melt had occurred, because when the inner Earth melts, it becomes more dense less volume and one percent of that total melt that's attributed to what is now the liquid outer core the volume of the liquid outer core if one percent of that melt had happened the pacific 
uh, plate would have dropped 10 miles by the, the decreasing volume of the inner earth would have dropped the plate 10 miles. And so because it was having to drop more like 30 miles, uh, just a few percent more, and you've got 30 miles. So, and much mass inside the earth was moving towards the Atlantic and you have these, now you have these arrows here on the bottom right that are showing how mass is wanting to move and slowly shifting towards the Pacific. The Pacific plate and mantle under it are faulted, melted, subsided towards the core and is now under the ocean. And once again, it's it's not magic. If you if you crush a sphere in a sucking motion in one place, you're going to get cusping and breaking, and just like you have in the Pacific, evidence that this happened in the Pacific because you have forty thousand volcanoes in that area where the crust would have been sucked down and put down below uh, below the magma and below the water of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and it would have fractured into millions of blocks and melted. Then the melted magma going up through fault lines would have created this massive concentration of mile high plus volcanoes. Here is the red, the red uh, circle is around the exact uh, center of the trenches, which is exactly opposite the mid-Atlantic ridge. And that's what you would expect with what the hydroplate theory postulates. So slow motion is shifting towards the Pacific today. It is a fact that land masses and mantle are moving towards the Pacific. And we know that by the increasing amount of GPS coordinates that are being constantly monitored. And some people said that they could, I don't know how good you can see this, but this red is the tip of the, uh, is the um, the feather of the arrow. And then it's going this way to the black. The black end is the point of the arrow. And so these, and the length of the arrow is how much it's moved. And so the a shorter length arrow is monitoring less movement than a long arrow. And so the actual plate movements based on GPS are consistent with Dr. Brown's hydroplate theory. And you might look carefully and see that there's some exceptions, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, but the actual plate movements are not consistent with conventional plate tectonic or catastrophic plate tectonic theory. And so why does the mantle shift today towards this region? Um, we're going to be looking at what's happening right here, and it's all based on a, a most important discovery by the Japanese that, that as pressure increases, as you go deeper and deeper into the earth, you have what's called a crossover point. People have talked about it earlier, that recent discoveries about changes in rock density deep inside the earth answer the question about why is movement happening because current and current ideas about plate tectonics are obsolete and untenable as a result of this. And, and uh, Fred Williams did a, a very great job of basically proving with crossover depth, uh, plate tectonics, catastrophic plate tectonics is not possible. And this was the art, this was the research paper done in 2006 by the Japanese. And so I'm gonna do a demonstration that Fred alluded to in his discussion earlier today. And it, I did it again in uh, in California I, 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 when I was in California, 2012, presenting this at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Rob Yardley actually had some glass pipe, and I used that glass pipe to make this demonstration, which I will now. We're going to look at uh, what you watch. to rock when it changes from solid to liquid, going the other way. And we're going to do a demonstration. Where's Jeff? Where's my buddy Jeff? He's uh, yesterday, Rob and I were talking. I go, can I use Jeff to be Vanessa White? And he goes, <laughs> he's going to be my, uh, probably not. Jeff, you're going to do this. Uh, it was kind of funny because I I, I, I have a hard time communicating this aspect because it's a little bit foreign to our way of thinking, especially for those that didn't like science when they're going to school. 
because you have to really have a grasp of density and volume to understand uh, what I'm going to be saying for the next few minutes. And all divers know, all scuba divers, which I, I, I'm a scuba diver, everybody that's a scuba diver, you already know what I'm going to say. All of you that's ever been a submarine sailor, you're going to know what I'm going to, what we're talking about, how density affects your buoyancy. Uh, so what we're going to be explaining here is that that ball uh, that's wrapped by a Velcro sleeve that's hooked up to a diving weight is, it is buoyant because its density is less than the water that it's sitting in. But inside the ball is air. And if I push that ball down in that column of water, the pressure of the water column increases with depth. In fact, it's roughly speaking for every two feet you go down in a column of water, you're gonna increase the pressure on that ball one pound per square inch. So as that ball goes down and keep going down, Jeff, as that ball goes down and he's just pushing it down with the hook and then he's gonna let go. So let go, see it's gonna float up and the, and the higher it gets, the faster it's gonna flow up. So, but as he's pushing it down, the pressure is, is compressing the air inside the ball, which is increasing the density, decreasing the volume, and ultimately you would get at a depth, which we call crossover depth, where perfect neutral buoyancy is achieved, to where the weight and the ball together, because of the compression of the gas, increasing in density, losing in volume, there's gonna be a depth where it's exactly the same density, the combined training aid is the same density as the water that is around it. And so then you let go and it will stay almost right there, a little bit further down to the clip or to the, to the place there. And then is what's, now just guess in your mind, what happens if you go a little bit below that? If you go a little bit below that, you're gonna compress that ball a little bit more and now the density of the ball and weight are going to actually be combined more than the water surrounding it. The volume will decrease a little bit more, and pretty soon it's going to sink to the bottom. So we'll let it. And the further down it goes, the faster it goes. Does everybody see that? <clears throat> okay, now, thanks, Jeff. That is really important. This, this is so critically important. This is not hydroplate theory information here. This is this is what they know about the inner earth by, they do know density because of sound wave traveling and stuff. But here, here's the, the density of rock that's not melted at the depth right at the interface between mantle and core, liquid outer core. So when a rock, that's solid melts. It goes from 5.527, and I don't, I, I'm not going to worry about the units, to a density almost double. Right here, it go as soon as that rock melts, it shrinks in volume by a half and becomes twice as twice as dense. Now that, and then when you're up higher, close to crossover depth at 220 miles instead of 16, 1800 miles. Um, it's going to be not that much of a compression. And so as melted rock magma falls down through a fault, it gets more and more dense to, to the point where it is now twice as dense as the rock around it when it's going down through the bottom of the mantle. And it cannot float up. And I bet, I guess I could have, we could have watched that column of water with my ball at the bottom and we could have said well now it's going to it's going to come up to the top and go back down to the bottom and go down you know that's what plate tectonic says uh no that ball is going to stay down at the bottom unless there's a miracle done so here here is the key to from a hydroplate theory understanding which is based on magma causing going up and down at the crossover depth, everything above the crossover depth, it's wanting to go up. And here's uh, another Mike, uh, 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 Brian Nickel animation. And so now, as soon as there has been an earthquake, 
and I'll, I'll go back again. As soon as there's been an earthquake, a shallow earthquake above 220 miles, it's going to melt rock. Earthquakes create melted rock. Now that magma is looking for a place to go up because it's floating. It's less dense than the area around it. And it wants to go up. And you can see it pushes it pushes um, crustal and mantle material away. That's going to create other earthquakes. And those earthquakes are going to keep on going until you all of a sudden you have a volcano because now it gets up to the top. And and then you can see you can see those lines. Look at those lines. They're going from it's a very little motion, but it's laterally moving towards that fault because you had volume of magma going up. And so then something has to move into that area. And so you have lateral movement. That's what's causing the continental plates and mantle underneath them to move. And this, so there's volcanoes that are going up to where we see them in the news. And there's volcanoes going down, which we can't see because we don't live in the liquid core. And, and this is something that's very important too. And it's you, you might miss it in the animation, but as that ball of magma goes down towards the liquid core, it has to have some place to go. Right now, that liquid core is one big solid sphere of liquid magma that's sitting underneath the mantle. So that magma that's wanting to fall down, it, it can't go into, you'll see that it, it makes the liquid core bigger. You'll see that it, the liquid core moves up because it just got some more. But what it's doing in moving up is it's pull, it's pushing, it has to push on the mantle above it. So because that magma that wants to get to the bottom has to push something up in order to fall into the liquid core. But overall, the, the density is increasing and the volume is decreasing, which is why the earth is shrinking every time there's a major earthquake. So here's another Brian Nickel animation that helps to make this clear as well. So there's huge flood basalts on the Pacific floor uh, that were a result that caused 40,000 seamounts and you have the volume out. So all that magma is volume out. But whenever there's something that's going out into those, into these volcanic cores on the ocean floor that are there today, something had to come in. You can't just create a void by that magma going out. And again, you have you have these bent-off zones, these fault lines of the suck-down uh, Pacific plate because of the rising Atlantic. So you have volume out and you have volume out going down. And there's a lot more volume out going down than up when you have a deep earthquake and it's going into the outer core. So, mm -hmm. so you have volume out, has to create volume in. You can't get away from it. Something has to move into those areas where the magma is escaping either onto the Earth's surface or into the liquid core because it's below the crossover depth. Moving plates don't cause earthquakes. Earthquakes create magma, which above the crossover depth flows up to volcanoes and below the crossover depth flows down to the outer core, causing the plates to shift. And we, again, this all explains it. Where, are, where was the Pacific pulled down? I mean, where was the crust pulled down as the rising Atlantic Ridge? It was here in the Pacific. Where, is, where are all these arrows going to? Into the mass deficiency of the fact that it was pulled down and the mass went into the core. And so there's a mantle mass deficiency because everything is sucking down that way. Actual plate movements are not consistent with conventional plate tectonic theory. And, and here's an example, just one of many examples. Here you, here you have a, this area right here of mid-oceanic ridge that has three different directions that it wants to go. So you, you, should, you by plate tectonics, you would say that this ridge here around the, in the inside of this black circle would want to have motion go this way. And you would have motion go this way and you would have uh, motion go this way, but we see that all the motion is still headed to the Pacific, which is consistent with hydroplate theory, not consistent with plate tectonic theory. 
Earthquakes are faulting and occurring in the mantle and crust are collapsing on a smaller and smaller inner earth. This gives the appearance of subducting plates, but they are not subducting as evolutionists and CPT advocates describe. And here's a look at the, you know, cut out of the earth and you have the crossover depth. You have the mantle, it goes down to 1800 miles deep and you have the liquid in outer core and the inner core of the earth. And here's another animation from, uh, from Brian Nickel. And I'm gonna say that this is what Brian and I need to fix. <laughs> Uh, and uh, hopefully he'll agree when we get all done with this and have Q and A. But so there's faulting that causes melting, and once again, you have magma wanting to go up, magma wanting to go down. And what we're going to talk about that's different than what I thought about before is that there's two things that don't want magma to go down normally. One is, as we've already discussed in several other places, that the pressure in the earth is so intense as you go down that it's like putty and it just wants to create a seal. It'll seal off any fault that's deep in the earth. So how is there a fault that allows the magma to go down? And I'll answer that question later on. See, this shows that that fault line, it's just there and it's ready to send the magma, but the pressure would cut that off except for one item that we're going to be talking about later on, and, th and think about this, what, what I'm going to propose, and I've never thought about this, that looking at my little animation here with the little dot that I have, what I think the, the what's happening in the earth today is there is melting in these deep earthquakes, but the magma doesn't go down into the core because there's no, in the liquid core, because there's no room in the liquid core for it to go down. So the fault is a liquid a liquid tower that goes up to some level within the mantle where it's waiting for the pressure that's coming up from the liquid core. There would have been arrows coming up here. It's trying to push up on the mantle and the crust that's above it. But until it exceeds the frictional forces to do so, that, that column of magma is going to stay there. And it leaves open to where that will become a deep earthquake place from then on. And as soon as the mantle, the liquid core is able to push up on the mantle to create an earthquake, a massive earthquake, uh, it's going to stay there, even though it's like mercury, it's a mercury column that wants to come down, but it can't come down unless it has a place to go. And the core is full, the liquid core is full. Expound on that more later. So as magma falls 1,600 miles from crossover depth to the outer core, potential energy is converted to thermal energy. Just like anything that you drop off a 1,600-foot building, when it hits the ground, all that thermal energy and destruction is, is uh, potential energy that was converted to thermal and kinetic energy. And so that makes it so that that's enough energy to melt 88 times the original mass. So if I have one pound of magma at the crossover depth, and it's going 1,600 miles down to the liquid outer core, I have 88 more pounds of mantle that will melt. There's enough heat to melt 88 times more mantle, which is going to create a runaway earthquake sometime in the future. So crossover depth, notice the density crosses right at 220 miles. Uh, the density of rock at 220 miles when it's solid and converts to magma melts it does not change in density it stays right there just like my ball in the demonstration stays right in the middle uh that's why there's not as many earthquakes at 220 miles this is a this is the number of earthquakes based on depth so and and it's just like what our demonstration as magma is here, an earthquake causes magma 200 miles, then uh, it's going to go up. And what does it do when it's going up? It wants to increase in volume. So it's going to create more and more and more earthquakes as it's going up. And the same thing going down until you get to a point where the mantle is just putty and you're not going to get any breaking of mantle and therefore earthquakes. So 
Below the crossover depth, pressure is so extreme that rock will decrease in volume. Just again, looking at this line, this is the, it's on the, it's on the density line for solid rock and it will become liquid rock when it melts and its volume decreases, its density increases. Therefore, magma cannot ascend from depths below 220 miles. It can only go down. And that's different than conventional theory. And so what's happening to magma? Again, earthquakes, magma is wanting to go down. Magma above the crossover depth is wanting to go up. And decreasing volume is undermining the foundation of the mantle and crust above the melt. This is why the earth is still shrinking as evidenced by shortening of days after major earthquakes. All major earthquakes are detectable now to actually speed up the rotation of the earth. As we talked earlier during Q and A, the, the moon earth uh, relationship because of tidal action, the, the earth is losing its rotational speed by increasing the orbital speed of the moon causing the moon to get further and further away from the earth every year. But earthquakes speed up the earth because mass is coming closer to the center. And here's proof Japan earthquake shortened days, increases Earth's wobble. The nine magnitude in Japan, you know, back then last Friday was powerful enough to shorten Earth's day, increase, you know, the because the speed of the earth sped up by 1.8 microseconds and it threw the the uh the wobble of the earth off by 6.7 inches the earth rolled permanently rolled to a new wobble axis that was 6.7 inches different than the axis before proof that the earth's mass is moving closer to the earth so and we've already talked about the density change and so now this is setting up for a global earthquake, as we're going to see. Because here, let's say that there's a piece of mantle that melts because of an earthquake and creates, and what it's going to do is create a low pressure area. And when it creates a low pressure area, that means all the rock and mantle around there is trying to flow to that. But to flow to that is to create an earthquake. So at first, it's just going to be a low pressure area until something causes a push it past the threshold of the tensile strength of the mantle, and then you're going to have an earthquake. And when that happens, you know, so then it's going to cause an earthquake as mantle material moves, and then that's going to cause more melting. That more melting is going to create a low pressure area, which is going to create another earthquake and another low pressure area. When a severe enough melting occurs deep in the earth to start this chain reaction, the result will be a cataclysmic global earthquake that would be as earth changing as the Bible describes. So the, the earth is set up for a global runaway earthquake. And here is a demonstration, another Mike, uh, another Brian Nickel uh, animation that that talks about this. And And in this animation, Brian does show more clearly how the mantle and crust is pushed up as a result of the liquid core growing because of magma reaching, ultimately reaching the liquid core, adding to its volume, which requires it to push up on the mantle. So look carefully what's going on here. As the Magma is going down, it's getting bigger. The ball of magma is getting bigger and it's heating up 1800 times. It's heating up the area around and it falls into the liquid outer core, wanting the liquid outer core to push up. And this, this pushing up is not just there. It's all over the world. This is why a deep earthquakes releasing of magma to the inner core or to the outer core <laughs> can cause an earthquake anywhere in the world. That, that pressure is pushing under every single square mile of the mantle that's above it all over the globe. And wherever the weakest place is, it's going to cause an uplifting of that mantle slash crust above it. So then you see that, that the crust 
caused, uh, you know, the mantle pushed up because of the increasing volume, but then there's also the melting of all the other material around the mantle. mantle. And so you see that now all that other melting that occurred because 1800 times. And so then because the volume is decreasing of the melting rock, you're going to have the mantle and crust come down. So the overall effect is the earth is always concentrating more and more mass to the center. But there might be earthquakes, and they've noticed this, that actually push land mass up, even though the overall mass of the earth is getting closer to the center of the earth. Now watch that because all that volume decrease that caused that to come down, again, there has to be lateral movement to that area. So the arrows, the yellow arrow, arrows are showing if volume decreased in this area, you have to have mantle movement into that area. And we see that in the animation that Brian Nichol uh, developed here. So what does the Bible teach about earthquakes? Is it Does it say there's going to be a global earthquake? No record of earthquakes before the flood of Noah. They have been in our past since the flood of Noah. Future earthquakes, they will be in various places, according to Jesus. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, pandemics, <laughs> and earthquakes in various places. Meaning, And that various places implies where they're not normally located. Uh, Revelation 11, during the tribulation period, for those that look at it that that's future to us as i do in the same hour there was a great earthquake a tenth of the city jerusalem fell and the in the earthquake seven thousand men were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the god of heaven the second woe is past behold a third war uh third woe is coming and so that there's going to be global earthquakes and i asked steve malone prior to the 2012 presentation in Costa Mesa, um, I asked him, based on what we know about plate tectonics, is it possible that all major faults around the Earth would rupture at the same time, causing a global earthquake? And his answer was no. It, it's not possible. The greatest that you would ever get is 9.5, and there won't be, not all the faults in the Earth by their plate tectonic mindset could all go at one time. Uh, future earthquakes, they will be global. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven, beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall fall to the ground. Now some would say it's Ezekiel 38 that's pertaining to what happens in Israel, and it just means the, word, the earth means in the area of Israel. Okay, well, there's other verses too. Uh I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Every mountain and island was moved out of its place globally. Every island, mountain moved out of its place. Uh, there will be unprecedented in magnitude. There was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth and had not, uh, since men were on the earth, now the great city Jerusalem was divided in three parts and the cities, the cities of the nations fell. Every single city on planet earth is implied here is gonna have complete destruction of all of their buildings. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And a global runaway earthquake like was demonstrated in that animation would fulfill this. Uh, and it will cause the earth to roll. The Bible says that the earth is going to reel to and fro. The earth is violently broken. This is Isaiah 24, 19 through 23. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. Uh, because then Jesus is going to return, restore the earth to a condition where men will be living in peace for a thousand years. And so the Bible says there will be global earthquakes in the future, but seismologists say that the global earthquake cannot occur. Possible conclusions that current plate tectonic understanding is correct, but God will work a miracle to fulfill the prophetic scriptures, or plate tectonic explanation for earth movement is fundamentally flawed, causing scientists, including CPT scientists, to be in error. So um, they've been in our past. 
Future earthquakes are global, will destroy cities, move mountains, move islands, and cause the earth to roll on its axis. And so now let's say, okay, well, there are many deep earthquakes. <laughs> so how, how bad are we being set up for a runaway global earthquake? Well, if, if there were no deep earthquakes, we would say none. There, there's not a problem. But there are a lot of deep earthquakes below the crossover depth. And we can tell, and, and doing so creates a undermining the mantle, which I use as this uh, sinkhole picture. <laughs> In a way, that's what's happening. You know, obviously this land was undermined by, you know, water or something below it. And it, all of a sudden the land just dropped. The, the mantle is being undermined by every deep earthquake is setting up for a low pressure area that is causing um, the desire or the, the the stresses to try and move to that low pressure area to create an undermining of the mantle. So I've been plotting using USGS um, uh, website, uh, uh, deep earthquake since 2000. And here's a bar graph. There's been some, some noticeable, if you put a line across that, you'd see some notable increase, but I'm doing it for when it's going to get really uh, increasing, which I believe it's going to. And so here is, and this is what I want to do to teach everybody. Well, um, this, this is, and I know you can't see it very good, but right here and where I have my little red dot, right here, right here, and right here, every year for all these years I've been monitoring, that's where deep earthquakes occur. Nowhere else on the planet, except every once in a while, you get a deep planet over here in South America. Extremely rare that they're found in other places. And I think this is very significant. The deep earthquakes are only in this area. This is also where we know the Pacific plate crashed down and it would have done massive melting along the edges of this plate as it broke away from the Asian plate. And so there were in, in 2022, there was 285 earthquakes that were deeper than 220 miles, greater than 4.5 magnitude. And I'm going to teach you how to query earthquake data. So you can do your, I'm, I'm hoping that there can be a bunch of extra earthquake query people that can come up with something that might make sense. And uh, so here you go to, you just Google on a USGS earthquake map. And when you click on the link to that, then you'll get this map. It comes up with this map. And Go to and this is the actual what what the address the URL address for it is, and when you do you get this map, and so what you do when you get that map is you click on you click on this uh, little setup icon and that pulls down this whole thing, and then you're going to search earthquake catalog. So then you click on that search earthquake catalog down on the bottom right, and then. You select custom magnitude, time, and location. So what's the magnitude you want to query for? You just either put 2.5, 4.5, or you tell it what you want. Then you do a date and time. You, this one, I have it between January 1st, 2022 at 0, 100 to December 31st, 2022. This is what I did to get the how many earthquakes there were in 2022 that were greater than 220 miles. And then where I said I want the whole world. I want I want to query the whole world. Uh, when you want to just pick a certain location that you want to look at, you also click on that. We'll show you that more about that later. Then you go. I want advanced options. So you go down and to advanced options, and you click on that. That opens up what then allows us to pick the minimum and the maximum depth for the earthquakes that we're looking for. So 354 kilometers is 220 miles. So it, you got to enter the numbers in kilometers. So I said between 354 and 1,000 kilometers is what I put in for the query because you're, you're not going to get any earthquakes at 1,000. So I, I want to get everything that's deep. And then you click on search at the bottom left. And when you do that, you then get this screen 
which has it, it defaults to the newest earthquake first. And you can see, again, these are all the earthquakes that were greater than 220 miles in 2020. You click, you drag down largest magnitude first and you see, and, and look at the magnitude, seven, seven, 6.8, 6.8, large, deep earthquakes. And they were very deep, 354, is 220 miles, and these are 579, 660, 630. So the, the, the highest magnitude earthquakes are very deep earthquakes. And they're all mostly concentrated right here in this area of Fiji. That's where mo almost all the quakes, a large percentage. Then you can click on the base uh, you can click on base maps right here with, with this icon and you can turn it into an ocean view or you can get a street view or a satellite view, a terrain view. And so that's an ocean view and this is a satellite view. And so this is location of 220, uh, 2022 earthquakes, 285 that, were, that are using the satellite view and, you, and they, it shows up a little bit better. Then... What I did is I changed to, I want to just see all the earthquakes between 200 and 240 miles, you know, 20 miles on each side of 220, which is by data, the place where crossover depth is, the earthquake data. And so there's only 28 earthquakes right at the, within 20 miles of the crossover depth compared to the 285 that were all together. Now, I want you to notice this, that look at this, it's almost like a string of pearls right along that same way at the crossover depth. And you don't see, you don't see the um, crossover depth over here in South, South America, but you do see them in the same areas, which are right, this is right where the Pacific crust broke off of the Asian plate and subsided, right? All along here, it's where the, crust broke off of the continental shelf and subsided. And I suspect that that's, this is what I think is new, <laughs> is that it's in this area that there is a pipe open that is all the way to the liquid core where the magma is piled up in the pipe looking for someplace on the earth to have a vertical lifting of the mantle so that it can empty out. And every and so when there are accumulation of earthquakes around the earth that cause the mantle to get to the point where there's an uplift of the mantle by the flow that, that allows the liquid outer core to push up on the mantle that is having to adjust its, its volume into the area of earthquakes and loss of, of material because of volcanoes on the surface and, and volcanoes in, below the 220, then, then all of a sudden, some magma is going to release, which is going to create an earthquake on its way to the liquid outer core. That's just, again, it's <laughs> recent speculation on my part. And it would be really good if somebody like uh, Dr. Bumgartner would uh, take a look at that. And maybe this even explains some of the, um, si the um, seismic wave data. It's concentrating in this area. This area, there's something... There's something going on right here, mostly right here, that is causing deep earthquakes. And this is a bigger blow up picture of, of that to show that string of pearls along that area. So today the plate movement is towards the Pacific, uh, which is deficient of mass, but look at these areas, see everything, Every, you know, these arrows are going to the mass deficiency in the Pacific, and these are going to mass. But now we have these arrows that are going towards South Africa, you have South America. These area, arrows you have going into the area where you have deep earthquakes. Deep earthquakes are magma going down towards the liquid outer core, creating movement of mantle that is wanting to go to there instead of the center of the trenches like the other arrows are headed to so that shows that something significant is happening in that area so now we'll shift from there to um earthquakes with unusual phenomena that are explained by the hydroplate theory 
Uh, basically, as we've already pointed out, when, when major earthquakes happen, the seismologists go, wow, how did that happen? How did that? Oh, we found a new fault. Oh, a new fault. A new fault. Oh, a fault we didn't know existed. Denali earthquake on November 3rd, 2002, up in Alaska. Um, we're going to talk about that. The Indian Ocean earthquake um, called the Sumatra earthquake or the Banda Aceh earthquake on, well, it was Christmas Day for us. It was 26, December 26 for them. Um, Japanese earthquake of March 11, 2011. And here, the the Alaskan earthquake up in Denali uh, affected our area here in Seattle. And this was a nightly news um, presentation on that day of how Lake Union here in, in Seattle had, it, it shook like somebody took the lake and just shook it up and, and messed with the uh, houseboats that were moored uh, to the land. And it was just going, kabam, kabam, kabam. That's one of the eyewitness accounts on Lake Union where houseboats suddenly rocked so violently that water and sewage lines snapped in two. The whole thing shifted actually quite a bit of distance. Floating homes were rocking differently than any of these homeowners ever witnessed before. Not this up and down. Right, you would usually get if a boat like came this. through here. Um, and so we just didn't, it was very disorienting. And then we realized that it was water going this way. And seismologists say they could blame the Alaska quake. While it didn't generate a tsunami, energy waves traveling through water could indeed slosh Lake Union. You do get this very low frequency motion, very slow up and down. And that can cause bodies of water to sort of slosh a little bit like in a bathtub. Seismologists say there are similar reports from Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans and from nuclear power plants as far away as Minnesota, where tonight they're asking the same questions heard on Lake Union. And then looked out to say, what is happening here? Um, now, that seismologist is the same one I asked if there could be global earthquakes. Um, he, was a, he was the guy that I contacted. And now he says, oh, yeah, you can get that uh, from the slot. Okay. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, um, probably, you know, dozens and dozens of lakes between Denali, Alaska and Lake Union. But the, what we know, what we find here is just this shaking in our lake. And so there's there's only one explanation for it. And Lake Pontchartrain. So here, here's a little animation. The, the earthquake in Denali went all the way to Lake Pontchartrain down in Louisiana. And I talked to somebody who lived during that time in, in Lake Pontchartrain. And it was snapping one inch mooring lines of big, big boats that were in Lake Pontchartrain. And he said, it looked like somebody took the lake and just shook it, like a bathtub just shook it. Uh, that cannot be explained by a plate tectonic mindset, uh, but it can be explained by hydraulic fluid, magma, and water trapped under the North American continent by the subterranean water that didn't escape. And now we have a hydraulic uh, pushing the brake up at, at uh, the Denali, Alaska. And when you push on the brake, the hydraulic fluid is looking for weak places. And we have Lake Union as a weak place. And Lake Pontchartrain in Louisiana is a weak place, and it shook those areas. Um, earthquake in Mexico creates desert tsunami 1,500 miles away in Death Valley National Park. And this was in 2022, September 2022. Mexico quake, 1,500 miles away. And you can watch the video on this. Just Google on earthquake in Mexico, Death Valley tsunami. And you'll see this area of the Devil's Hole Cave. And you'll see the pictures there. I don't have an animation of it. The picture on the left is like, hey, there's nothing there. And then all of a sudden, a wave comes crashing in. And it's just back and forth for several minutes. There was a tsunami in that underground cave. Alaska-Mexico earthquakes, unusual phenomenon explained by the hydraulic effect associated with trapped subterranean water and magma, allowing earthquakes to transport energy over vast distances where the effects are felt at weak portions of the crust is the hydroplate theory explanation for that. Um, now let's look at the Indian Ocean earthquake. The giant 204, 2004 Sumatra earthquake ruptured the greatest fault length of any recorded earthquake. 
spanning a distance of 900 miles or longer than the state of California, rather than tearing the land apart all at once, the rupture started beneath the epicenter and progressed northward along the fault at 1.2 miles a second. The whole rupture lasted about 10 minutes. Compare this with California's 1994 Northridge earthquake, which ruptured about 20 kilometers, 10, 12 miles, and lasted 50 seconds. Now, this is the Sumatra or Banda Aceh earthquake that killed hundreds of thousands of people in the tsunami, the, the most massive tsunami uh, that we've experienced in our lifetimes. It was even worse than what happened in Japan. And so look at these are the earthquakes in a three day period. So all so again, I could query USGS and I put a day on each side of it. All of those earthquakes and it start that what they said is all these earthquakes started here where my red dot is and it just worked its way all up this line, which happens to be the north tip of the 90 East Ridge, which is a hydroplate theory explanation of why this happened. So <clears throat> again, Here's the night. Here's the north end of the 90 East Ridge right here that my little cursor arrow there. And this this is the area of the earthquakes. This is the area of the earthquakes here. And so what's happened, the 90 East Ridge is when the earth rolled uh, during the compression event and the change of mass. You know, it stopped whenever it stopped when the mass stopped changing, but there still would have been some stress. And so, but what's really trying to happen there is the earth is trying to come apart at the north end of the 90 East Ridge because of the bulge of the equator. It's trying to come apart, which translates down to the lower mantle and to the liquid core, a area where there could be a push up from underneath to fill in that area as had happened when the original ridge was, was made. That original ridge came by magma pushing up mantle into this area because the rip had to occur to give the extra circumferential area of the earth as the equator rolled to a northern, uh, more northern latitude. So, um, you got to see Brian Nichols' YouTube presentation on the Earth roll to fully explain if you didn't understand what I was saying there. So, and I and I'm going to skip the the bowling ball routine. It's been showed before, but the Earth will roll if if there is a change in mass on the Earth. The Earth is going to roll a mass distribution. It's going to roll, and so here was a um, news item about this when and, and basically I should say. It happened on a Saturday night because the last thing I did uh, was check the USGS map that day because I was doing it daily because they didn't used to have this query feature. And I, I just went, whoa, <laughs> I couldn't believe. I go, oh, the 90 East Ridge just ripped open. And I knew right then, I, I knew that night, and I talked to Walt Brown you know, the next day, it was Sunday morning after the Sunday morning service, Dr. Walt Brown about it. By then, I knew that the tsunami had occurred. I actually kicked myself for not for not even thinking that there would be a massive tsunami because I knew the ridge rose up because of where the it was located. And um, and then several months later, they came, you know, the science uh, showed that that's exactly what happened. Number 2004. Their combined expertise has successfully pieced together the evidence from the bottom of the ocean. They've ruled out giant underwater landslides, and in a scientific first, observed uplift on the ocean floor of almost 40 feet. This has changed everybody. I had no idea that we would actually see these really big displacements in the ditch. I thought we might see some faulting and maybe some rubble, but I had no idea that we'd see these big displacements. So it was fabulous. We measured ranges of displacement, sometimes three meters to 12 at one point. And we know that this displacement happened in many locations all along the margin. And it started further south. And then like a zipper, it just opened up all the way up to the northern coast. It's a discovery that has changed our understanding of the creation of these giant waves. 
Okay, now plate tectonics cannot explain that earthquake. The, the, it wasn't a place where plates were diving, where plates were this or that. It, it was a vertical rising. And hydroplate theory explains it. It even explains why that was a location where it would occur. And plate tectonics, CPT cannot. So I wanted to let you know that to query the query that I did there for those three days, I picked, you know, you go to select custom magnitude, time and location, and then notice on the right, when using custom location, you click on that orange bar and notice that I picked December 24th to the 26th. So from beginning of 24 to 26 or so three days. And you then, you're then allowed to do a normal kind of uh, mark the map where you want to look when you hit that triangle and you say, okay, that's what I want to use. And then you click on, okay, finish the query and you end up with those earthquakes that occurred during that time. And um, so earthquakes with unusual phenomena, the Japanese earthquake, and we're running out of time. I want to leave 15 minutes. <laughs> so I'll just, I covered this in that DVD that you can watch. You can watch it online uh, from our YouTube channel at our church, uh, Earthquakes 2012 Update. But magnitude nine earthquake struck Japan and it sped up the earth 1.8 microseconds, threw it off 6.7, like we said. Uh, Isaiah's prophecy implies there's going to be greater ones like that. The some of Japan moved 18 feet um, towards the epicenter off the coast, applying the hydroplate theory, including how earthquakes can be predicted. There was a focus of the earthquake down in the mantle. It was deep enough to be in the mantle. There was earthquakes. Um, days before and it was just like bam 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 earthquake after earthquake to the point where uh, uh, one of our sound guys dan mo on a wednesday night service he was doing sound i came in he goes kevin did you see what's going on off the coast of, of uh japan there, there's just earthquake on top of earthquake something big's going to happen so dan mo predicted uh the fukushima earthquake based on hydroplate theory uh, awareness so magma is flowing up Create and and see here's a here's a prediction of earthquakes. When you see earthquakes in the ocean that or any place that is increasing thermal, this is thermal imaging days. See, this is this is when the earthquake occurred, but all of a sudden they saw this by ocean temperatures, and so that is one indication that we've got an ongoing volcano stuff going on. And volcanoes create earthquakes. Volcanoes are magma being released. If magma is being released, then that means wherever it's coming from becomes a low pressure area. And that means that something can move into that low pressure area, and it could be violent enough to be an earthquake. So that's what happened. Uh, and the melting is occurring, creating a scaffolding condition where the lower melting temperature stuff is becoming magma. And then it all collapsed. The magma just got pushed out through the fault line and everything collapsed, creating magma shooting up underneath the crust, which bowed the crust up, which we'll cover later. And, and the stress building up, this is something they also noticed in Fukushima. This is also a production technique that is causing people to send up, you know, the, the Chinese just sent up another satellite uh, to do this, to check for ionosphere perturbations. And so the, there's a stressing of the granite, creating that piezoelectric effect that others have talked about. Um, John Bumgartner says it's impossible for the granite to create electrical charges. I, I, I haven't heard him recant that, but he should, because it's now common knowledge that earthquake lights and massive currents are developed in the crust during earthquakes. And so it created a charge uh, in the granite crust, which perturbed the ionosphere to create electrons to concentrate, and it was picked up by satellites. So, And that was before the earthquake actually happened. So there was two reasons they should have thought there's something about to break and <clears throat> rare earthquake lights uh 6.8 earthquake in morocco this is september 20th 2023 so four, day, 
three, four days, three days ago, this article came out that when um, Morocco had that earthquake that killed several people, uh, there was earthquake lights associated with electrical currents being generated in the crust. Uh, and, you know, 2,900 people died. And then this is how come the, this is how the tsunami occurred. So when there was the collapse of the area that had been melted and causing volcanoes to form on the ocean floor, when it collapsed, it pushed up the magma underneath the crust and lifted up the land, creating the tsunami. The Japanese quake lifted up the seabed 16 stories, largest recorded giant slip and uh, spawned the earthquake. And, and then Japan moved into that area where magma had been displaced and that's why it stretched 18 feet in some places. Summary, earthquakes are not caused by thermal convective currents in the mantle. They are caused by the mantle moving towards the trenches and by expanding and contracting magma. These forces started as a result of the flood. Deep earthquakes are setting us up for the big one. And uh, we're going to see more of this in the future. This is a whole building that just toppled because of a horizontal movement of the crust, which meant the horizontal movement of the mantle underneath it as a result of going into areas where magma had created a, a low pressure area. And evolutionary plate tectonics theory, as well as CPT are inconsistent with Bible and science. Dr. Brown's hydroplate theory explanation is consistent with the Bible narrative of flood prophecy it is scientifically sound. The Bible warns us in the last days, people would mock the global flood and coming judgment. As a result, they have believed the evolutionary lie and cannot understand that the Grand Canyon and earthquakes are consequences of past judgment. Even worse, many have rejected Jesus as their savior, following in the paths of those who rejected Noah's warnings before the flood. And God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, 2 Peter 2, 5, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. He preached for 120 years to a mocking population, and then the flood occurred. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And there's an and the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And the Hydroplate theory would predict that when we do get um, more runaway situations, when that you know, number of uh, deep earthquakes increases and therefore the pressure builds all over the globe for wanting to put stresses on fault lines and break mantle and uh, crust above, there's going to be massive volcanic eruptions that are occurring, massive earthquakes. And that's what God says. And it's all a result of the flood. So the judgment of the flood of Noah 5,000 years ago, is now reserved. He, he, God says they're reserved. The, the consequences are, are waiting to be unleashed in the future to be a judgment by fire upon the global kingdom of the Antichrist and those that hate God during the tribulation period. And right now we can avoid all that by getting on the ark today which is Jesus. And I really want to just end with this because it's our whole session is ending that um, everything that the Bible has said about creation, about the flood, about the history of the Jews has all, it's all being validated by facts that we know. It, it testifies to the fact of the divine authorship through inspired prophets and apostles that there is a true God, he knows the future, and he so loved us, he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we, and we reject that to our own hurt. And most people do that, do reject it as Jesus prophesied. He said, wide is the way that leads to destruction. But as in the days of Noah, he left the door open on the ark for all who would come in. And he, he said, he desires that all would repent, all would come to salvation in Jesus. 
And uh, I hope that if there's somebody out there that's just interested in the science enough to come and join us, but you don't know Jesus, it doesn't, it isn't any good. As I was talking to somebody earlier, uh, the people that crucified Jesus, the Jews and the Jewish leaders, they were young earth creationists. They believed in the global flood of Noah, but they died in unbelief. Jesus said that they were of their father, the devil, because they were rejecting the mission of Jesus, which was to come and take our place in judgment, to die on the cross for our sins, to give us everlasting life if we just humble ourselves and realize we, we, and, and just confess to God, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I'd mess up heaven if you let me in. I want you to change my heart. I want you to forgive me and wash away my sins so that I can have everlasting life with you, the creator. Amen. Who made a way for us to get there. So that I, I just pray that you would just get on your knees and receive Jesus as your Savior if you haven't done it already. So any questions with seven minutes left? Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Lee. What a tremendous blessing. I do like how you how you tied it back to the Bible and ended with the most important message because that's what matters in a hundred years. A lot of stuff we do trade, we waste a lot of time on stuff that doesn't matters and you brought it right to the forefront. And so thank you very much for that. There was a question about the discover uh, video that you showed the discover episode. Do you know where you could find that or the name? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I got it from them way, way back when, when it happened, and okay. just, uh, contacted them. It's, I, I've got it as a file, but okay. you could back to, um, you know, discover and say, you know, just ask them to, to, to rebroadcast or to show that it, it, it was a whole special on everything they did to find that lifted rich. Okay. And could the heavens and earth reserved for fire be equivalent to God creating the pressurized fountains of the great deep and reserving it for the day of judgment in Noah's 600th year is a question. Well, I mean, it, could, it could be similar. I, I mean, I know that there's differing views upon, and today I learned that there's differing views on the hydroplate theory preconditions before the flood. Um, I still stick with Dr. Brown's um, that equilibrium would have been achieved. And that it was something that uh, man did or that God just says, OK, I, I know what's going to happen if I uh, any he, he, I, I believe God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen. But he I think there was equilibrium condition. And so but it was reserved. It was there. If man wants to rebel and kill all but eight people that that are God fearing. I mean, imagine that the whole earth with nothing but eight people that fear God. Mm. Yeah. We know that as soon as they landed, it wasn't very God-fearing on, on some of them's part right afterwards. So we are, as sinful people, we we are bent on rebelling against God. So it was reserved and unleashed. When God allowed the crust to break, judgment came to the world by flood. And it's all reserved now. Magma is reserved to create a global cataclysmic event during the tribulation. Amen. And, right. and, and Lita, and you know, I mean, earthquakes are happening today, and hundreds of thousands of people are dying. I mean, so there's there's even today, there's that consequence of sin that is cursing our world as it has since since Adam and he fell. Mm. Amen. Lawrence says it's a great conference. And then there's a question about that uh, submarine that sunk trying to find the t Titanic. Did that cross over the crossover point, or do submarines have to worry about that? The crossover point uh, no i mean so well in a sense submarines like i said I, I i was on submarines and i was a diver and and the thing is you want your density to be neutral or um buoyant because as soon as it becomes uh as soon as your buoyancy your density becomes greater than the the ocean that you're keeping out of your people tube, then you're going to, you're going to die. You're going to sink down. So it, 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 the part, the problem was their hull breached and now the water came in. So now they don't have an air. They don't have, so all of a sudden they became extremely dense. They became just as dense as the water plus the weight of the, uh, of the submarine. And so they went rapidly to the bottom. Thank you. But it wasn't a crossover depth issue. It, okay. it's, it's that they lost their hull integrity. 
So when you were in the ocean, when you were school, when you were, how deep would you be when you'd be in that uh, situation when you were in the Navy? Uh, on a submarine? Yeah. We're not supposed to tell. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I, okay. That's good. If the magma under 200 or 220 miles can't get up, you have a sort of black hole effect where nothing can get out. It only goes on, but surely there are other forces that keep a black hole from forming. Isn't downward pressure offset? By extra heat or something. I, I don't know what he means by black hole. So well, I think he means that it just it goes in and nothing can come out, is what I think he means. Read it one more time. If the magma under 220 can't go up, you have a sort of black hole effect where nothing can get out. It only goes in. But surely there are other forces that keep a black hole from forming. Isn't well, I mean, and, and this is a little complicated to get your mind around, but so at, at let's say you're at 230 miles. So you're just below the crossover depth. Yep. So there's an earthquake at that level. So rock is going to melt and it wants to, it wants to decrease in volume because now it, when it melted, it wants to become more dense, but it can't Im immediately because it can't just create a void. So what it really does is it, it creates a low pressure area that puts it back at 220 miles. Does that make sense? So the pressure, because it's trying to shrink, but it can't, it's creating the pressure of 220 miles, even though it's at 230 miles. Does that make sense? If, if okay. I hear see you nodding. Okay. And then what has, so that's why I said it doesn't, it doesn't truly shrink to the volume it wants okay. to just on the curve. It creates a low pressure area. So now at 230 miles, all the mantle but around that sees a, a lower pressure than the mantle, than the pressure is under at that place. So it wants to push in to that, to that magma to allow it to go to the density it wants to, but that's creating mantle movement. Okay. I can share my screen uh, and kind of have a graphic up there that shows what okay. what's be what Kevin's describing. If you if you okay. want, Kevin, yeah, yeah, real quickly, real quickly, we've got a couple minutes. And while he's doing that, there's a question: the new evidence for oceans in the Earth water bound in mantle rock alters our view of Earth's composition. Uh, use, uh, they're, they think use seismic waves to find magma generated at the base of the transition zone around two, 410 miles deep. Does this affect the HPT? Uh, they found mon water, bound, water bound in uh, mantle rock is what uh, they... Well, as they Fred found. Williams did such a wonderful job in his two presentations that, yeah. that you know, being able to use seismic waves or anything else to determine what's inside the earth is extremely difficult. It's like you can't even use it. And the the uh, um, the deep drilling project in Russia proved that. The deep drilling, it, Russia's analysis of their deep drilling project of seven miles was you, you um, geophysics people with your sound waves told us that we were going to find this and this and this, and you were wrong. It, 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 multiple situations. And I think Ellen deals with that in her book as well. So okay. yeah, that's the video that I showed, Brian, go ahead and do it again. Oh yeah. I'm, I don't think I'll play it or anything, but this just describes that it, it wouldn't form a black hole. It's that the volume that comes in is what comes in from the adjacent to where the fracture is. And that's what's causing the mantle as a whole to slowly inch by inch move toward the Western Pacific. It's like it's collapsing toward that, that um, cavity that is being created by magma either rising up above the crossover depth and blanketing the Pacific floor, or it's traveling down uh, toward the core. And so whatever volume loss in that particular area that's heavily fractured, uh, whatever that is, it's all moving toward that, that region of earth. That's why the data of that NASA data that Kevin showed is, is all pointing in that direction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the HPT have an explanation for the long lifespans before the flood? 
did something get e- the atmosphere get ejected with uh, which affected lifespans post flood um yeah um dr brown uh his chapter on the origin of earth's radioactivity um and it's not radioactivity that comes to us from cosmic rays you know that was the whole canopy theory explanation was you know the canopy shielded us from radiation and that's what kept us living so long and the radiation went away. I've got 2.3 REM in my Navy nuclear power days crawling around in reactor compartments. And uh, I, I'm not 23 years older. I mean, some people might say I look that much older than I am, but <laughs> you know, I didn't age because of 23 extra years of radiation that exposed me, but we're eating radioactive material and that inside of us, especially carbon 14, uh, which which is greater concentration assumed greater concentration because there's not as much atmosphere shielding us and uh there was a lot more carbon at the time so it would have been a lower percentage plus uh at creation we had access to the tree of life and and what god said is we got to get man away from the tree of life or he's going to be able to eat forever and so the decreasing days after the flood of noah um showed that i think it, it, and so does dr brown that the increased radioactivity that was created at the flood entered into our food chain especially uh carbon 14 where my body wants to use carbon 14 but all of a sudden it turns into nitrogen and that does cell damage and and can mess with dna and every wherever else your body is using carbon it can create um it, it just lowers the longevity of human beings. Okay, yeah. thank you. I think I'm going to thank the people for attending this. We will still keep hanging out afterwards. Last night we hung out for like an hour and there's a bunch of people with it. But I would like to thank everybody for attending this uh, first hydroplate in the history of the hydroplate conference in the history of the world. I think this is a historic event. I think this is a seed that is going to start a scientific revolution. Thank you.